Well, hello there, everyone. This is Clint Finney again for Eastern Ohio Grazing Council web presentation from May the 21st, 2020. This week, I decided to talk a little bit about what high stocking density grazing is. I think in the last few slides or last few presentations, we, we've talked a little bit about high stocking density grazing. There may be some of you that are asking questions about what that really is and and how it relates to you. Uh, as with all my web presentations, there's no real book or place to go and read and, and learn what the actual real definition of high stocking density grazing is. So again, you're getting the Clint Finney kind of definition of, of what I feel that it is and what it is to me. So uh, hopefully with this presentation, you guys will have a little bit more understanding what we're talking about when we're talking about high stocking density grazing and uh, whether it'll work out for you. So let's get started. So first, what is high stocking density grazing? We, we abbreviated to HSDG sometimes. Sometimes you'll see UHSDG for ultra high stocking density grazing. Uh, and then there are other forms of grazing that kind of take on that high stocking density grazing uh, form, be it adaptive grazing, mob grazing, some of the holistic management uh, talks about high stocking density grazing. So basically what high stocking density grazing is, is having um, in excess of 100,000 pounds of animal per acre. Now some of you are, are going, wow, I've only got 25 cows and let's just use round figures here today and they're a thousand pounds a piece, that's only 25,000 pounds of animal. Uh, so this isn't for me because I don't have that many pounds of animal. Uh, no, and we're going to explain a little bit more in, in future slides about how to calculate this. But for now, let's just stick with what it is. And, and so high stocking density grazing kind of starts at 100,000 pounds uh, of animal per acre, but can go up to 250,000 pounds, 500,000 pounds, even to a million or more pounds per acre out there for grazing and, and and notice there there's no unit of time here so we're just talking about putting that many pounds of animal per acre out there all the time so let's think about this though in, in terms of your current stocking density grazing i alluded to that 25 cow herd a thousand pounds if you put them on an acre a day you're at 25,000 pounds per acre if, and, and the way that we graze typically in Eastern Ohio, we've got 25 cows, 1,000 pounds a piece, and we've got them on a three acre paddock for a day, let's say. Well, that, then we have to divide that 25,000 pounds up by three. So somewhere around 8,000 pounds per acre. So that's considered a very low stocking density. Uh, so high stocking density is just increasing the amount of animals, or, or look at in a different way, it's it's tightening our paddocks up and, and making the cows be in a tighter area. Um, high stocking density grazing kind of has its roots in, in thinking about the way that the natural herds uh, moved across our native grasslands, and so they they were they were crammed up in in herds and migrating across an area. And they had predators uh, at the outsides of the herd that were always looking to take advantage of, of the herd. And so they, they kept themselves compressed. And so high stocking density grazing is kind of a, a further thought of, of managing our forages, our grasslands, the way that they had historically been managed by the wild herds. And we'll talk about this a little more as we go into some further slides here. So why would we want a higher stocking density? And I alluded in that last slide to it being or mirroring um, the way that the native herds had moved across our grasslands. I read this somewhere, bison biomimicry. I believe that came from Alan Williams uh, where I saw it. And Alan talks a lot about uh, the native grasslands that we had in the United States and how much of the United States was actually covered in native grasslands. I will contend that what we learn in elementary school about this uh, part of Ohio being a, a vast woodland is not the woodland that we all have pictured in our mind. Um, think about how we have in our mind's eye a forest looking like forests look here in Eastern Ohio today. But 
there was no one around to harvest trees back then. So those trees that were here were huge oaks and maples and uh, ash and chestnut and all those different species that were huge trees. And so there was an, uh, an appreciable amount of forage there had to have been. There also was no multiflower oaks at that time uh, underneath those trees. And so there were herds of wild animals that that cycled through areas. And we did have some native prairie units in, in eastern Ohio. Uh, there's one uh, probably about three miles from where I currently sit uh, that I happened to, to find when I was out with a landowner one time. He knew it was there and showed me, but uh, really cool native prairie. So those prairies and, and that grassland existed here in the eastern United States, the same as it did in the Great Plains same as it did in the southern parts of this country. So we did have those native wild herds moving across these areas. Now, was it different than the Great Plains? Sure, it was. Were they different animals? Sure, they were. But we did have native migrating herds going across our landscape. Uh, so let's think we, we might, might want a high stocking density grazing to, to mirror what the, the native grasslands grew up in. But wh why that, I guess, is the next question. Um, our, our forages and our, and our grasslands and our soils uh, were, were developed from the beginning of time um, by those wild native herds. And that's what, what our, where our soils perform sort of in their best. Uh, but let's go to some measurable sort of things, reasons why we would go to a high stocking density grazing. First one I have listed there is increasing the carbon content of our soil. Uh, it will increase the carbon content of our soil, although not where we think it might. So when we're high stocking density grazing, we're basically trying to put the animals in a tighter group. We're trying to get them to eat what is there and available and is of good quality. And we're trying to get them to trample that that is there and of lower or poorer quality. So when we mob graze or we high stocking density graze a field, we may be only trying to harvest 30% of the forage that's out there. And we try to get them to trample the rest and maybe leave 10% standing. So we would be trampling almost 60%. There are other ratios. I mean, we may only may be trying to harvest 50% and trample the other 40% and then leave 10% standing. But there, there are different ways and different ratios we'd want for different things. Um, but in all those instances, we're going we're gonna to have some trampling. That's part of the main tenet of, of high stocking density grazing is we'll have some trampled forage. And that in turn will increase our carbon content in our soil. Although not where we think it might. We all think that because we put that extra litter down, that extra residue down on the soil surface, that will increase our carbon content. Uh, not so fast. Really, that that will contribute to our armor of our soil. It will contribute to the cover on our soil. It will help us hold moisture. And in the end, it will help us to build new soil above the soil surface we currently have. But it may not increase the carbon content of our current soil directly from the trampled residue we have left there. Uh, but what will increase the carbon content of our soil is the, the root mass that those plants have accumulated. When we're going to high stocking density graze a field, we typically are going to let that get to early stage three maturity. So just past the boot stage, just about to the point where the head's there and it's, it's almost going to start drying down. Uh, we want to catch it uh, when it's still in the reproductive stage, so we're still getting it before it full-blown goes to seed and slows down its production. But kind of just before that is where we want to hit that. And that's where the, the most amount of forage will be out there in the field too. Uh, so as we've talked before, uh, grass grows as much root below ground as it does above ground. And if we've let that forage kind of get to that, that advanced maturity, the roots have also got to that advanced maturity. And when we graze that off, we have uh, roots that are going to slow in production. 
but they're because they've been grazed but uh that root mass is then in the soil and and it's a living part of that plant when and if that root mass dies back uh, that's going to increase the carbon content of our soil it, also we, we need to think of it this way uh, i i tend to to look away from uh from root die back so much because I'm not certain that it's dying back as much as it's slowing down when we graze it. Uh, what I'm looking at more now is that those plants are putting out liquid carbon to the soil and in doing so that carbon then feeds the microbes uh, and can be left in the soil as carbon content or organic matter as we see fit. Uh, I talked a minute about the cover, and the cover is going to contribute to a surface layer, to a, an organic layer. It's going to contribute to holding more moisture. Then the last reason we may want to consider ultra high stocking density grazing is because we've let that plant get to that early three maturity just before it heads out and goes full blown seed, is that we've also created some deeper rooting opportunities. And as we talked before about soil fertility, uh, our, our soils have fertility below the eight inch layer that we test for soils. And those minerals can be brought up and brought up into that forage layer to then either be trampled, harvested and left as manure or, or be standing there in the field to contribute to the nutrient content of the upper layer, layer of our soil and therefore grow us more grass as time goes by. The last thing I look at for this uh, is that it helps us manage a pasture that may be heading out. Uh, this is the time of year when we're going to start seeing those areas where the cows are going to refuse to graze some parts, they're going to graze other parts more. Uh, this is the time when I start doing high stocking density grazing because it helps me manage those seeded out and headed out times uh, of the year. Uh, I have learned over this last year, especially, that I have I have taken too much. I wanted the cows to harvest too much of that forage. I need to trample more of it and let it go and let it go to the soil and let it grow me more forage for two reasons. As I just mentioned, it'll let me grow more forage. The second reason is because if, if I take too much, everything else ahead of me is heading out, is going way too mature. And that's reducing my production as time goes by. And the last thing I'll end this slide with, uh, I just heard this quote today from Paul Brown. He's the son of Gabe Brown. Many of you have heard of regenerative farmers in North Dakota, but he, he said, livestock are our biggest tool. And that may not sound like much to, to some of you, but to me, that was a, a, an epiphany moment. Um, livestock are what we're managing out here. We're using our fences and our poly wire and our electric and our high tensile to manage our livestock, but livestock are our biggest tool for regenerating our soils and for profitability in our overall operation, especially when we're talking about a grazing operation. I forgot to mention the pictures to the right there. Uh, this is from my farm. It's the hilltop above my mom and dad's place. These are from last spring. Uh, where I went in on 12 inches of forage with a 250,000 pound stocking rate. Just our 30 cows uh, broke up into small paddocks and grazed that field. Those are the same pictures 12 hours, same place 12 hours later. Uh, and that just shows what high stocking density can do for us, especially in this springtime where we've got forage that's ready to be made as hay but we don't necessarily have the weather to do so. So I, I, I take that problem and turn it into something good by improving our soil health with the trampled forage. And instead of waiting until that hay is way over mature to get it baled, I can turn it around, get that paddock regrowing, keep it vegetative for the rest of the summer by going through and, and grazing it with a, a high stocking density very quickly leaving forage on the soil surfaces residue uh, that's then going to recover and, and give me forage again in 30 45 60 days so i alluded in an earlier slide about us calculating stocking density and how would we do that with smaller herds 
Uh, I know that 100,000, 250,000, a million pounds per acre sounds intimidating to those of us that only have 25 cows. If we're talking about that 25,000 or 25 cow herd, 1,000 pounds, I, I know that's not that's not practical, but just for round figures, I, I'm just thinking that uh, we, we've got 25,000 pounds of animal. That's our total herd weight. We divide that by the acres offered uh, out to decimals if, if need be. And uh, that will give us our stocking density. So we've got 25,000 pounds of animal on, and on one acre, 25,000 pounds divided by one equals 25,000 pounds stock density. If we split that acre up five times, that means we have paddocks that are 0.2 acres. 25,000 pounds divided by 0.2 equals 125,000 pounds per acre. So that's where we get our stock density. Uh, we, we take an acre and we split it up smaller. We take our paddock size and we split it up smaller. And, and again, notice that there's no unit of time here. The unit of time is how long it takes those animals to have the desired effect. If we're trying to trample 60% of the forage and only harvest 30%, leaving 10% standing, then we only need to be there you know, a couple hours and that's fine stocking density really doesn't have any measure of time so don't think of it with a, with a unit of time uh, we're just trying to get a desired effect there so how do we do that we, we've got to do it with frequent moves we don't none of us have a herd uh, big enough to, to have that kind of effect without frequent moves we've got to realize that a cow eats all day long yes they lay down and ruminate most of the time a cow is only going to eat for eight hours but they're going to do it in in small shifts so we've got to, to have frequent moves during the day to be able to get those higher stocking density rates. And I realize that some of you that have been to my operation have said, well, yeah, this is what you've been doing all along. Well, it is, although I've got a new understanding of, of what, what I'm trying to do and, and how I'm trying to do it. So if we're gonna do frequent moves, that, that's gonna either, it's gonna do a couple of things. It's gonna uh, put some more labor on us because we've got to move them more often. And that's where most folks kind of balk at stock density is because it's gonna mean a lot more labor to them. But we do have things out there like bat latches and air latches, and, and I've got a picture here of a bat latch from Gallagher uh, that will help us to move fence. That bat latch can hook to a, a corner post. You hook a slinky or spring gate to it. You set the timer and it goes off to move cows. So uh, you can have multiple bat latches out there in the field and that will move the cows for you. Uh, we're not really worried about back fences in these st high stocking density situations. I don't want to say we're not worried. We are. So maybe once a day they need a back fence, but they don't need a back fence every single time. And, and the cattle will automatically go into areas that haven't been grazed and haven't been trampled. So when that latch goes off, I up till now have been doing all my stock density stuff by myself with, with my labor without a bat latch. I, I would love to have one. They're a little pricey. Um, I'm sure that there are folks that have figured out other ways. I've seen some air latches out there that, that work on compressed air. Um, but these are products that are out there. And, and even though they come with a price tag, uh, I can tell you right now, the way I manage things, sometimes there, there's a whole lot of value in having something out there that would move the cattle for me, especially either first thing in the morning, during the day while I'm gone at work. The other thing to consider is the water. Um, most of the time, the water would be set up in the first pasture, and as they move, cows will go back to drink as long as it's less than 800 feet. It's the same concept we use with, with normal grazing. They will go back through those gates to get to water. We need to make it the shortest distance between two points, but they will do it and go back. So uh, in the end, that's, that's why we talk about stock density uh, is, is to, to be able to bring uh, livestock through a system to, to, to create a desired effect, to, to trample um, the forage, to create some soil health opportunities, to manage a pasture. If we've got an area that's really weedy, uh, this is a great way to, to both, A, force the animals to consume the better parts of those weeds, and two, to trample those areas uh, to create a litter on the soil surface and hopefully to get some more desirable forage to grow back in its place. 
Well, that's a wrap for this week's presentation. I hope I, I gave you all some insight into high stocking density grazing and why we would want to do it. Uh, I'm always faced with the fact that I'm trying to make these presentations short uh, and informative and to get you thinking about why we would do the things that we do. Right now, out there in the pasture field, I've got several calls and several questions about why aren't my cows eating this or why aren't my cows eating that? And, and so the answers to those questions are because the forage is, is better quality where they're eating and lower quality where they are. And so this creates some of those high stocking density grazing situations or where, where it would be beneficial to us. Uh, I know I interchange mob grazing and high stocking density grazing back and forth. To me, in my mind, they're a lot interchangeable. Um, but here coming up, and we're going to have a presentation about managing the spring flush upcoming. But this high stocking density grazing is a way to help us manage the spring flush. And it's also a way to help us improve our soil health uh, on a fast track, I guess. Grazing in itself is, is helping our soil health, um, but high stocking density grazing will, will kind of send that into overdrive and help improve our soil health out there in the field. We'll end today again, as always, by thanking our sponsors. Um, we thank all of you for tuning in. Be looking next week uh, for our next installment of a virtual pasture walk. Beth and I went out and shot the video for that today. Uh, we've got to put it all together, but we're real excited about the virtual pasture walk we've got coming up for you. With that, I'll say we'll see you next time.